Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, thank you for joining us here this morning on LinkedIn Live as a part of Citizen Development Week. Uh, we're very excited to kick off this session this morning on artificial intelligence driven citizen development and business agility, a winning combination. Uh, so as we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Isaac Linder uh, here in Denver, Colorado with TrackVIA. I'll be your moderator this morning. Um, and I'm very excited to be joined by our esteemed panel uh, of guests. We have Steve Higgin from uh, TAP, the Agile Application Platform, uh, Jesse Fu here from Sirius XM, and Sai Vinod from Evansis in their newly opened office in uh, Chennai, India. So uh, fantastic. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump right in because we have a limited amount of time here this morning, and we've got a lot of great ground to cover and a lot of great topics. Uh, so for those who've been following along uh, with the events of Citizen Development uh, Week, uh, you know that today we are looking particularly at the impact of technologies within the artificial intelligence, the machine learning um, space, and the way that these technologies are affording new opportunities and breaking new ground within the citizen development uh, paradigm, within the citizen development world, really. There's a lot of different angles that we can go um, but I'm just going to start by opening it up with a, a more general question, and we'll let anybody uh, hop in, and then we'll we'll start to go through uh, into a little bit more detail um, many of the facets and many of the aspects of this question. So, to start at a relatively high level um, and just get the conversation started, how? For us experts all working in different aspects of business and different parts of business, how can AI enhance citizen development? Um, and I'm thinking particularly of whether or not folks have real world examples of artificial and in, artificially intelligent, uh, you know, driven citizen development tools or features that you've added to your platforms or that you've seen successful uh, in business. I'll open it up and let anybody um, start before I start calling on people this morning. Uh, let me, I guess, let me, let me first start. Uh, so uh, first, I want to say that I'm speaking for myself on uh, my experience. I have my current company, SiriusXM, and my past employers and my views are for myself, doesn't represent my current employer or my past employers. Um, so when it comes to how AI can enhance citizen development, I think uh, I think I think I think one of the things that I've seen is that it uh, when you think about citizen development, the citizen development is a movement to try to uh, bring uh, bring uh, capabilities to the to the business user to allow them to code and to program. When it comes to uh, AI and especially the current trend is to allow people to be to do this complex statistical analysis, these these complex uh, things uh, that uh, by the by the by the business users and the citizen developers. So um, AI can enhance this development because now that when you build a program, you can also you can you can either include the AI capability, like for example. Now we know the big buzzword is ChatGPT. Uh, we can we can start we'll, we will start seeing tools, uh, these local local tools incorporating being able to call on features from generative AI such as ChatGPT, or uh, or you can have uh, the AI sort of look at look at your your scenario your case and provide some some examples on how to deal with your, uh, these, some of these scenarios. So some of some of the things that I've seen. When it comes to how citizen developers have been playing around with ChatGPT, and say, "Hey, I have such and such scenario. How do I resolve this with this certain tools?" And 
ChatGPT will back out some ways on how to handle them. Uh, and we also know that uh, uh, even outside local local tools, we also even see we have seen even pro code developers that have been throwing in Python code and have have uh, these AI tools debug your, your program or make it better. Uh, so these are some ways that I think uh, AI can be implemented. Uh, when it comes to actual seeing how things have been used, and in, in, in my past experience, I have seen organizations using AI uh, to look at, to, for example, um, and before this call, we just talked about tax. Uh, I have, I've seen that, that when a company has a lot of transactions and they're trying to figure out like, uh, and they have, they have these transactions that, that are happening among different states, different countries, and different jurisdictions have different tax, tax rules. How do you classify uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, what set of rules to, to treat these certain transactions? So I've seen, chat, I've seen uh, using AI tools to look at what has been done in the past and do machine learning and figure out how to uh, classify, categorize the treatment of these particular transactions. So these are some of the things that I've seen how AI has been used and how it can enhance its development. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you for that, Jesse. And yes, uh, it's a uh, uh, welcome that tax day in the continental US is now behind us as of yesterday. Uh, but some uh, some very good use cases there, particularly with regards to solving increasingly complex problems that historically would have been developer centric. Um, Steve, I'm curious from your experience if you have any examples uh, that you'd like to to bring to the table by way of introduction. Certainly, I think the uh, the biggest challenge is the fact that actually when we talk about AI and citizen development is actually what my, most people actually understand by AI. I mean, even talking to pro code developers, not many of them have got much experience of actually using this technology in a, a way that is actually um, pragmatic um, and uh, reliable because much of early AI technology has been actually um, uh, inaccurate in terms of uh, and inconsistent in terms of its precision. I mean, I remember using uh, Microsoft's uh, um, image recognition, gender recognition technology, to, and it always um, looks at me and thinks I'm a 90 year old Chinese woman. So the problem is actually is actually about the is when you start embracing and making use of AI, you need to actually have something that's predictive. Um, mm -hmm. So when we start then talking about how citizen developers start to embrace it, um, it's about understanding at what level do they engage. And this is where, as, as we talked about, uh, or the previous speaker mentioned about um, ChatGPT. That as a tool is actually a great way of actually then leveraging uh, an AI type engine to actually then give you chatbot and feedback type information. And as a practical example, we're working with a, a local college where actually they're managing how um, students actually um, and enrollment co come in for the next term. And one of their biggest problems was actually how students decide what they're going to do as a career. Um, mm. And actually with ChatGPT, you can now say, well, actually I'm interested in veterinary um, uh, and animals. So it will give you a list of careers and therefore subjects you could study. So now they're using that to actually then provide a, a much slicker front end for students and parents to be able to then select the courses that they want to do. Um, and so now that, that's where actually you've got an example of actually AI being used in a very progressive manner um, and in a way that actually is not so um, prescriptive to, uh, for example, using AI to identify a particular medical condition where something has to be right every time and you can't um, actually rely upon or uh, um, expect biases to occur and actually then start having false positives. So I think the challenge for citizen development is actually understanding and taking those small steps first of all to learn how actually AI can benefit and then depending on whether or not actually you're using AI to help you with building applications and actually speeding up the, the time it takes to build an app or whether you're consuming it into an application is also a different kind of um, consideration. So again, I'll just uh, finish at that point. We can cover off some more as we go forward, but thank you. 
It's fantastic. I mean, and it reminds me that uh, since we are speaking about citizen development and AI in a global context, it is very helpful sometimes to step back and make sure that we have a shared vocabulary and that we have a shared definition um, about the types of opportunities and technologies that we're talking about. So uh, really amazing examples. As your moderator, uh, you know, I'll just throw out the uh, example that with these technologies, I like to think about the current state of artificial intelligence tools and machine learning tools as really being able to uh, respond to four primary use cases or four primary categories. The technologies are very good at classification and identification. Um, we also have what you mentioned, Steve, the more anthropic use cases, which is to say uh, being able to generate natural language, features like chatbots, features that are leverage conversational language. Um, translation is another big one. So for those of us who have use cases uh, within citizen development that need to be internationalized or need to work with data that comes from different natural languages. Translation is a big use case as well. And then I think you get into these more speculative areas. You get into some of the more exciting or possibly scary uh, you know, speculative areas. But you brought up a great point and I'm gonna transition. I see that uh, Sai is back with us. Um, and I'm gonna put you a bit on the spot, Sai, with this next question which is about the challenges uh, that you have encountered with artificial intelligence, citizen development, and business users coming together in the same mix. Are there any, any challenges or particular considerations that you or your customers have had to address when implementing anything that is AI-driven uh, within your citizen development processes? Sai? Yes, uh, yes, uh, as I so uh, actually it was a very interesting uh, question. Um, so from my perspective, uh, currently the mood is like uh, we are all in mood of uh, AI. Um, when it comes to challenges of uh, citizen development, right? Um, um, so usually uh, the first challenge starts at the knowledge base and the documentation uh, issues when we are educating the uh, team. So with the enhancement of uh, citizen uh, uh, AI in the citizen development, uh, what we can uh, do or uh, uh, how can we solve the challenges is like, um, whenever we want to um, create a knowledge base, we want to segregate it to the uh, questions of how to questions, when to questions and why to questions. So while doing the citizen development journey as a coach, what I did is like, uh, I whatever the questions that has been asked with citizen developers, I took those questions and I um, segregated those questions into like how to questions and uh, why to questions and when to questions. This is very one important stage uh, because like when the documentation is huge for the citizen of uh, the, the platform you're using, right? The citizen developers are unable to go there and identify the exact place, like, like how they want to set up a data structure or how they want to develop a table, right? It is very hard for them to. That is where the first challenge uh, comes in. And the second challenge comes is like, um, it is not uh, about uh, building the um, solution or building the application. It's all about having the thinking about the problem and going uh, designing the problem is the most important uh, area we want to focus. So um, with, with uh, the, the other challenge that I would like to share is about uh, designing the solution before uh, building it. Um, if we create a solution or if we go ahead and build a solution on a snap, right? It is like, um, if you want to scale it to the other enterprise level and all, it will be a very difficult uh, task for the IT departments or uh, any people who involved in the next step. So the, main, the other important challenge or other important task for the IT coach or advisor is, is like, to design it properly and then uh, take it from there uh, to avoid all the challenges. Um, I would like to say uh, these two challenges. Uh. That's fantastic. Jesse, Steve, anything else to add on challenges? Sai was touching a bit more on, you know, what I think is really the tip of the spear in a lot of um, these conversations around citizen development, which is, has the organization yet been able to even adopt that model fully? 
and do they understand the steps that are necessary for proper governance and scale uh, of a citizen development organization before you even start to think about uh, things like artificial intelligence or other tools that might be able to assist the process. Any other thoughts about the, Yeah, I think I think the um, the challenge actually for business is the fact that actually um, it's my favorite fr uh, phrase, you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so we often uh, walk into organizations from a consulting point of view um, and are talking to them about a business challenge. And, and one that came up recently was actually for a private Asia aviation client where they were wanting to maximize how they could actually um, park the number of aircraft around their terminal um, for different uh, seasonal peaks and troughs. Um, but as you can imagine, in an airport uh, for different types of aircraft, there are huge numbers of rules. And some of the um, people that have worked in this particular arena have been there for 12 years and have a huge amount of knowledge. What they were expecting to do was actually then have an organization come in and codify in a, a conventional programming sense, every single rule, where actually we presented to them the ability to actually then have observational based training data. So they currently plan and actually map out where aircraft sit within the airport. And what we can then do is actually then collect that data and use it as training material to then give them an expert system with a machine learning approach to help them in the future. Completely unaware of the fact that this technology exists is readily available and can actually then dramatically simplify and actually adapt with them how they're actually working and operating. So I think the biggest challenge is the fact that actually it's not the fact that they can't embrace AI, it's about even being aware of how to exploit it in the right way. And that's obviously, as I'm sure we're all doing here, um, how we're advising our, our clients around how to leverage this technology to best effect. So I think that's the, the, the biggest part of it is actually the awareness. And uh, as I think someone mentioned earlier on, chat GPT, it's everywhere. But actually, what does it actually mean? You know, bringing it back to something simple that people can grip onto and then do a small incremental steps. I think there's an important part of actually what we should be doing to help citizen developers embrace this so they can leverage it in the right way. Uh, so Finn. what I want to add to that is, right, um, number one, I think what comes to mind uh, when it comes to a technology, the new technology, generative AI like ChatGPT, number one is security, uh, it's data security, uh, especially because uh, this AI, this is a machine learning that is going back to going back to a company where you don't have a agreement on, on how they're using your data, right? Because I think uh, pro many probably have already read it in the news, like I think it was Samsung that, that had an engineer yep. that asked ChatGPT to, to look at some code. And now, now, that, now, now that internal plan or the internal uh, uh, sh should have been, should be company secret. Now it is, uh, now it is part of the, Part of the uh, the training data for for ChatGPT, uh, so I think when it comes to generative AI, the most important thing, the biggest challenge is, is security and how we get around that. And I, I think Microsoft is working on some uh, commercial uh, solutions where where it, they'll, they'll segregate data that's feeding uh, per every client, uh, but that is that is something that I think uh, will consider will consider uh, will concern uh, business decision makers. Uh, now, yes. besides that, right, when it comes to actual implementation, like things that I've actually, that, that me personally, that, that I've seen that, that we have struggled with uh, is that uh, um, when it comes to more, particularly like when it comes to machine learning is to not have the right amount of training data. Uh, for example, uh, working in accounting and finance, uh, one of the, the use cases we have is OCR, which is, you know, which is a type of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, you know, you know, Typically, they're called they they call it computer vision, right? The, and um, so it could be that 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 uh, that uh, as a as a business, you decide to use this technology, and the vendor comes demo some with a with a data set. Everything looks great, but in real life, then you realize that the the training data was not enough to cover what you need to what you need to uh, do OCR on. Right, so this comes into this. So this comes to the limitation of, of understanding like what makes artificial intelligence work. Right, some some of the some of the business executives they think anything you throw at artificial intelligence, they should be smart enough to figure it out. But if you don't, if 
you don't know what how it works, then it's not going to work, right? Uh, number three, I think it's that I think a, a struggle for system developers is that they need to know what right looks like, especially with a tool like ChatGPT or or OCR or any type of AI tool. You have to have a you have to have a sense of what right looks like, right? Because you need to be able to judge, you need to be able to sample check and make sure that what you're getting out of is is correct. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes like people say, oh, let me just plug in this AI tool and whatever comes out, that is going to be the answer. And and that that's not always the case. Because I, I've tried, I've tried like throwing some weird questions at, at, at uh, different AI tools. How do I solve this with that? And then it gives me some off the wall response as like that it, it's like because i i work in accounting and finance i know that is not the right way to treat this transaction right and uh if for a system developer if you don't have that sense that you know that that ai is not always correct then you might rely on it and get in trouble so those are some of the things i see that that will be challenging on on how citizen developers how businesses adapt to ai Really amazing set of points, Jesse. Just to recap for those who are just joining us, I see a lot of folks joining chat. And, uh, you know, for those who are maybe finishing your breakfast or you are multitasking and you have us in one earbud, but you're listening to another meeting, and maybe your hackles started to go up when you heard Jesse mention security or mention uh, data protection. Um, it's a very good point to be cognizant of as we wade into these technologies really seizing the public imagination and having more commercially viable solutions out there. We have to remember exactly to Jesse's point that any information that is fed into a system like ChatGPT or Google Bard or another system that is uh, you know, being made available from one of the major players, that information is in the public domain at that point. So it really behooves us as innovators and business leaders, I think, to consider the impacts of that from a policy and procedure point of view. Um, for those of us who are in the security world, in cybersecurity or in IT and have a bit of a security or data protection, data privacy lens to the work that we do. It's really worthwhile looking to develop policies about how our employees and how our engineers should be interacting with these tools. Something just recently that's been a big conversation here uh, for us at TrackVIA is no, source code cannot be put into any of these tools, uh, per just exactly to Jesse's Samsung example information that is proprietary, you, you want to be very careful. Um, and of course, we're going to, as a, as a world of citizen developers, we're going to run into uh, obstacles. We're going to run into challenges as we learn to engage with these technologies properly. But I think for some of you who are uh, chiming in in the chat, who are um, looking perhaps more at orga organizational structure and uh, the legal lens as well, all the way down to the way that we execute contracts. Uh, it's interesting that we've started to see contracts where there are particular clauses in an MSA that says, yes, we are deciding to use a low code, no code platform. And we believe that citizen development is the right way to go, but we have a clause that none of our business data can be put into these third party tools because they also, you know, our customers, we also need to be making sure that we're, uh, we're doing right by them and that we're protecting their data as they come into our systems. So some good considerations. Uh, I'm gonna transition to uh, another question here since we've been talking a bit about some of the challenges and some of the obstacles. Um, I, I'd like to move over to considering some real world examples of where AI has been successfully implemented um, and of concrete outcomes that people have seen uh, from the implementation. Steve, you started out mentioning some very interesting use cases around 
students in the education space being able to uh, have a better sense of understanding their trajectory and their particular aptitudes in terms of what they want to, to study as they go into university. That's really compelling in the education space. I'm also thinking of the big areas, uh, healthcare, law, finance, that we've all kind of touched on um, and that are some of the hot, you know, really hot uh, industries, so to speak. Does anybody have examples of successful implementations and really wonderful outcomes? Well, I think a lot of the um, concern around actually using AI to date, as um, uh, ChatGPT talk about, is the hallucination effects, um, what we would normally call bugs. Um, and, the, and the issue is the fact that actually, if you can't rely and understand on the bias and the shape of the data and the truth or the source of that information, how can you rely and run your business on it? So I think obviously things like ChatGPT is an on-ramp to starting to make more use of AI. But I can imagine that actually we'll be start getting a lot more um, strict around actually the source of actually where we are deriving the models, the statistics that are driving the outcomes so that we can actually then understand whether something's got a, a deterministic um, bias to it. Uh, because the problem is that if we if we don't understand how our AI models are going to change, we don't understand where the impact is. So I think uh, one classic example that I know of a, of a company that has used AI extensively was actually a company called Scandit that was actually doing a lot of um, optical image scanning. And what they were able to do is actually play and learn through models um, to actually improve their optical scan engine to the point where actually they were you know, reducing the uh, number of errors from a OCR point of view down significantly in comparison to um, uh, other technologies. So I think there are some real world examples of actually how this technology is being used. But I think um, and I think uh, there are actually some legal uh, caveats around where you can use AI for things like uh, medical determinations. So again, yes. I think it's a, an interesting kind of area that's growing at the moment. Absolutely, and just to, uh, for some of those who are joining in the chat and, and watching us, I realize that we have folks from all levels of uh, aptitude or exposure within the citizen development journey. You might hear this term hallucination and be a bit, uh, be a bit confused. I know that I was when I first heard that term used in this context. It seems a bit scary. What are we talking about? Are we talking about, you know, a kind of Terminator uh, movie reality where AI is some scary thing that is uh, causing us to see things that aren't there? Uh, but that is not uh, what we are referring to. What, what we're referring to really goes back to the use case that Jesse brought up which is as an expert within his business space, he was able to see very quickly that some information that was given back from an AI was not correct. It was quite simply not the right way to deal with a particular business interaction. And Jesse knew that because of his tenure and his expertise and his time within that discipline. But when interacting with these technologies, they have the ability to what we call hallucinate knowledge based on the information that's being fed into them. We're not always going to get the correct responses back uh, for a particular context. And so for me, and I know for much of the conversation that we've been having, um, this really helps to remind us about the role, the continued importance of human intervention, of quality checks, uh, and of making sure that we're doing our due diligence um, in quality checking and really having process in place to make sure that the technologies that we are relying on, uh, you know, that, that we've got multiple places where we can make sure that things aren't going sideways. So to that point, um, great, I see we've got you back, Sai. I'm going to open up another uh, question. Um, just about more particularly, specifically the benefits. Um, you talked earlier about challenges within the citizen development model um, and your experience implementing with customers. Talk to us about some of the benefits of combining a traditional citizen development model with 
some of the technologies that we've been talking about with AI. Uh, more concretely, yeah, what, what, what do you see out there? Sure. Um, from my perspective, actually, how I see citizen development, it is like a combination or a collaboration of two intelligences. Like uh, one is a domain expert and the other one is like technology experts. They combine together and they, they try and they build a tool, with, they build an application with the notebook, right? So when the other the other intelligence come into the place, it, it like exponentially enhances the capabilities of uh, the particular platform and the particular um, um, citizen development community. So I especially see uh, benefits in three places. Um, uh, as like, uh, one is like uh, educating the uh, people. So uh, as a problem solver, as a technology person who is a, especially a problem solver, he doesn't have a domain experience. So when they utilize it tools like generative tools like uh, chat GPT or any other uh, uh, LLM models, to understand about the domain specific that is related to the, their work, it is exponentially fast for them to learn. And it is same for the uh, domain experts also to learn the uh, technology. That is where I see one uh, good benefit. And the second benefit I'd like to see is like uh, advising or coaching the citizen developers. Um, for example, um, citizen developers are very much good at uh, understanding the user journey, but they are not very good at understanding the user flow. So now with the natural language uh, um, processing or la natural language programming that we are talking with the general AI, right? So whenever uh, the citizen developers um, explain what what they want in terms of user journey, the tools like uh, uh, like Pega or Power uh, Platform or Power Automate uh, will be giving a flow for them so that they can understand the user journey uh, or user flow for that particular user journey. So that is uh, where I see a good benefit with uh, AA citizen development. It speed ups the um, process. And finally, the third thing I would like to uh, see is like um, uh, executing it. Like, for example, there may be a chance that in tomorrow, um, the AI continuously learns about the processes and all, right? So it is very adept or it is very good at discovering uh, at what place we need to build a citizen development uh, tool or what are the processes that are not good so that uh, uh, we identify or we can discover those processes and then we will utilize the citizen development community to um, um, create some good solutions for it or build some good products uh, for the customers. So um, on an, uh, on the whole, like I see three uh, benefits, like one is educating them and the other one is advising or coaching them. And finally, uh, doing the uh, repetitive tasks for the uh, citizen developers. Uh, fantastic. So I'm going to ask a uh, maybe a bit trickier and pointed of a question. Where does a customer begin? Where does an organization begin with thinking about bringing AI and citizen development together? Where do they, where should they start? Well, I think uh, I'll, I'll have a go answering some of that for you. Um, I think the main the main challenge is that actually, um, obviously, as we know, the reason why citizen development is coming to the fore mm -hmm. is because of the backlog of pro code development and the amount of work that they've got to do. I think part of what uh, we're actually then starting to see, though, is a, a step shift in the fact that actually AI tools can then accelerate actually both the creation of no code applications and actually then start to reduce the backlog that IT have got so that actually both can then be working much more in harmony together. Um, and that's where a tool like um, AI for citizen development for creation of apps can actually then help you um, start to then change the way in which organizations effectively function and actually then deliver uh, for actually shareholders and become a lot more agile. Uh, we're working on a technology that from a model will generate a completely functioning application in a few seconds. And then from that, it then relies actually on the citizen developers to make some fine tuning in conjunction with the developers. What that's doing is absolutely collapsing a software development lifecycle so that the process of building an app, even in no code, is actually a non-issue. And that's historically been a big problem for application development because the amount of effort and commitment that you put into building and testing an application is actually been a determinant for actually whether or not you can actually change your mind or actually evolve. Mm -hmm. Where when you have mm -hmm. technology which collapses this down to almost no time at all, actually you then become a lot more agile. So as a, a customer of obviously this type of technology, I think organizations that are looking to be a lot more agile can then look to then embrace AI with citizen development to then uh, actually work at a completely different operational pace and a different cadence mm -hmm. 
freeing mm. up the developer resource to work with the citizen developers so they can work in harmony together. Mm. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah, really fabulous. Jesse, any thoughts about uh, concrete benefits that you've seen uh, or where, you know, where the ro rubber really hits the road, so to speak, to use a colloquialism? Um, so if it, I, I think, I think where the rubber meets the road is, I mean, as you say, I think it's really to, and this is also like to answer, like, where do people start? I think it starts mm. with people seeing examples on what works and try it and get excited. I think that's, I think that's just, that's just in general, like, you know, how says the development happens, right? Like someone just discover a better way to doing things and then share with other people and people get excited. And I think that's how, that's how this piece of TikTok, like I share, I share chat G, how I use chat GPT with a lot, a lot of my, my, uh, no, a lot of my friends, my colleagues, they're, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. at my, you know, like the quality of this, like, Hey, just, no, I didn't do this chat GPT. And I think that's how it gets started. And I think it's also, a, I, I think, I think getting educated, getting upskilled and then, no, rubber meets a road means that you have you have live examples, right? Uh, just to yeah. give a quick example, like like what I've done is that um, uh, for 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 my citizen development group, like we had to come up with like a documentation template for visualizations, right? We scheduled we scheduled a meeting that we got to discuss, right? Like how how do we document this, right? I just threw the question at ChatGPT, copy and paste it into into our Slack channel, and people were like. Wow, this is amazing. I was like, yeah, this, no, I said, I didn't do this chat speech. I don't know. I, I and, and because uh, because I'm currently on leave, so I wasn't obligated to join a meeting. But I, I definitely cut down time because I already gave them a rough draft. Just take a look. And no, uh, someone already says it looks amazing. Uh, and and I think that's how you generate excitement. Like a lot, of, quite a lot, you no, know, some of the things I saw, I was like, let me just, and again, this goes back to you got not to throw in anything that is proprietary, like we just, previously discussed but things i say hey, i just want to see examples of xyz show me what you got right and uh and i, I think, think we see it happening everywhere uh, at least i mean yeah. certainly within customers that i work with with within our organization marketing will have some examples hr will have some examples of ways that it can be leveraged all business units within the traditional right. organization right. so i'm going to open right. it up just a little bit go go ahead jesse no, I, I'm, I was, I was going to say like the reason why businesses, uh, no, uh, especially these grassroots movements, right? Uh, businesses get interested and decide to adopt. It's all because of the excitement and seeing the benefits and seeing how it, how it cuts down time. That's that's how citizen development happened, man. It's kind of it's kind of like um, because you know executives not necessarily is well tuned enough on what's happening like and then no sometimes it's really just show them and say hey this is this is what it looks like and then and then no, and then that's how that's how you move from when it comes to citizen development how you move from shadow it into a governed citizen development program right same thing for ai there's going to be a exploration of phase right like people just exploring playing around with it and and no there has and then we still need to so I need to make sure that that there's there's people are educated enough to not not share any company secret externally, but but try but having these examples, I think that's that's how that's how we drive how we drive the adoption of AI and how how citizen developers get smarter and then how business get get the benefit out of it. I think well, the I think thing we, is I, it's the power of now. Sorry, Isaac, I was going to say I think it's the power of now as a developer. Um, obviously, we know how to develop, but as a citizen developer, when you're learning a tool, it's how quickly does it take to build and how quickly? Well, if you've got AI in your CD environment and you're building applications in half an hour that are fully functional talking to databases, that's actually going to accelerate people's actual excitement about using this technology and bringing in AI and investing. If it takes a long time for them to learn something then their kind of enthusiasm effectively then uh, sort of wanes. And so it then kind of uh, diminishes. Whereas if you can keep pushing and pushing and learning more, and that's actually where AI with these tools can actually then help you effectively deliver much more than you have been traditionally been able to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I was just going to say that I think that we may have struck a bit of a nerve 
uh, with this in the chat, at least as I'm seeing. So I'm going to encourage folks, for anybody who is listening, for anybody who is joining us uh, in chat on LinkedIn or here um, on a couple of the other platforms, throw some of your use cases into chat. I want to see what are the examples, what are the use cases, um, and I'll open that up to the uh, to our, our panelists here as well. I mean, real world examples, uh, Matthew and Victoria, a couple of folks who are joining us are, are really asking for this. Real world examples of applications, of organizations that have clear KPIs behind them. Sai, do you have any examples of real world use cases? Uh, yeah. Uh... I would like to share a couple of examples, uh, um, exactly like when it comes to uh, KPIs or the real world examples, there are uh, two things here. Like one is like uh, horizontally um, uh, big uh, enterprise uh, uh, platforms and there are some vertical uh, platforms. So if you take both, right? So for horizontal, the use case will be very different and the companies who have large amounts of data sets uh, that are segregated, ingested and all that, right, they can create uh, good uh, examples. And if I want to share a couple of examples, right? So for example, let us take a customer um, uh, service um, um, uh, division. So they'll be getting a lot of uh, mails um, related to different, different products they have or uh, different, different uh, campaigns they have conducted. So uh, it is it is very hard for the customer support uh, executive to go through the each email and uh, tag it like this is a positive email, this is a negative email, or uh, the sentiment is uh, great, the sentiment is not that great. So if we have an AI um, tool or if we have a kind of uh, AI uh, workflow that reads that emails and it will automatically understand what is the intent of the email and what is the sentiment, right? If it, it tags the keywords, okay, this email is positive and this email has a um, um, sentiment is positive. So that is one example where I uh, personally saw um, where we can uh, utilize this uh, AI in citizen development. It is very um, easy also. Uh, there are there are like if you want to build it in a horizontal tool also, it is possible, but there are other specifically tools that has been uh, uh, there for it. And if you want to share other example also, um, one from the e-commerce or um, um, one from the um, like uh, um, HR or any other departments, right? So I would like to share one uh, simple uh, or uh, simple example that we have built it in our um, um, thing, right? So uh, we have uh, integrated, uh, we have created a chatbot and uh, we have integrated uh, that chatbot to the um, chat GPT. And just take that as a starting uh, step tomorrow we can uh, remove the foundation models we can remove the chat gpt and we can um, add any other model as a, as a local uh, tool but currently with the chat gpt what we did is like uh, we wanted to modify the data that is present in our uh, hr records or any other records right so we can do that it, it is very much possible uh, for the organization and uh, uh, we, you don't want to raise an sr you don't want to create a separate uh, ticket for the team right you can just go to the uh, chatbot and you can um, uh, ask them okay my um, um, address has been changed or something else has been changed i want to update my record so that is very much possible uh, with uh, uh, when we um, um, combine the data and the workflows that is uh, that is what I want to uh, say with related to real world examples. Amazing. Let's stay on this topic because it's uh, it's generating a bit of enthusiasm as well. We have uh, someone in chat who is asking, "How about examples of machine generated application builders? Is there scope for this within AI?" Harry, that's a fantastic question. Um, I'll start out by saying yes, absolutely. Uh, us at Trackia, we are uh, actively looking at and implementing technologies for helping citizen developers get over some of those first hurdles um, as non-technical business users, understanding things like table relationships, understanding things like database normalization, some of these concepts that have been historically, you know, relatively arcane and technical, uh, we're definitely seeing the ability to be able to, using natural language modeling, uh, feed information about a use case, and then understand, ah, these are the kinds of steps that you need to take to materialize an application. But I know that Steve 
uh, in particular, and Jesse are probably going to have some other great examples um, or things that you want to riff on with that. Um, yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah. So, so, so from what I've seen, I, I know that Microsoft is working on something. To be honest, like the earliest example is probably the beloved Clippy. If people remember what Clippy was, like you in Word, you you dot, you type in dear so and so, and they say, "Hey, I think you're writing a letter. Do you need help?" Right. And I think that's where Microsoft is going with, uh, and no, rest in peace, Clippy. But they're, but I think they're, they're almost like doing a version of that when it comes to like their uh, local local tools. Uh, that that you give it, a, you give it a a uh, uh, a scenario, and then they're going to have a draft for you. So I th and then no, when I so Microsoft, I think they're working on something and now with their latest. Uh, latest investment in ChatGPT and then being able to tap into that technology, I think that's going to come even uh, come even uh, further along. Yeah, we're like we're actually that. doing the same thing as yourself, uh, Isaac, in terms of the fact that um, we've built and extended the the product at Tap to do exactly as you've talked about: classify databases um, from that, um, generate uh, low code applications, um, fully functional. Um, the benefit then is actually then helping organizations to create their own data model, not just a template of we've got these types of applications. You can literally create your own database or have an existing one, yes. point the tool to it, and it generates the whole technology for you. The benefit of that, obviously, is that actually it's machine generated, no code. But because it is no code, you can go in and maintain it and extend it as well, as opposed to obviously machine generation of applications is new. You know, this has been around for 20, 30 years, but it used to be that it generated low level code that you couldn't uh, ma manipulate or maintain. These technologies are now generating no code that anyone can go in and adapt and evolve. Um, and so, again, I think there's going to be quite a, a range of these types of technologies. And, um, and the benefit of this is actually that, again, it collapses the learning curve. That's where AI actually kind of helps. You know, we've got ChatGPT helping us with uh, large uh, LM models to ask questions and generating responses. This is now putting a data model and creating an application in a few seconds that you can then evolve and extend. So again, yeah, absolutely. Um, we can see that this is uh, an area that's getting a lot of interest. Yeah. Fantastic. Sai, I believe you may have had something you wanted to add as well. Yeah, I would like to add one important uh, um statement uh, that i have read in the morning uh, is that like there are other people are asking like ethical considerations for ai driven or so actually um i read an i read a paper um in the morning from the microsoft uh, research so they are trying to develop a low code llm so uh, uh it i felt it is very interesting and it's very fascinating for uh, um ai citizen development driven guy uh, like me so why i'm saying is like um usually if you if you see right we don't know the, the reasoning of a chat gpt or we don't we can't explain uh, what is the process behind uh, chat gpt while giving the response and the only prompting is very uh, important at this point of time right so they are creating a low code uh, llm with the workflow so what it will be doing is like we will pro we will add a prompt and the prompt will be converted into a workflow and then um, the user have a um, um, chance to modify that workflow and create a subflow and he can add his own inputs according to the company needs or whatever it is like he can add his own input so they are calling it as a planning uh, llm and then um, there is a separate llm called executing llm so based on the input side right, not based on the prompt based on the input it is going to generate the response and it is showing to the user so i think this this will create this will generate a lot of interest uh, to the organizations and it will uh, create some ethical side also it will add some positive to the ethical side also because uh, there is a human in the loop and uh, humans are in charge of the prompt instead of uh, have, uh, instead of sh sharing a very creative prompts and all right uh, they can modify the workflow they, uh, usually they are currently proposing the six steps so we can delete a step we can add a step and uh, we can modify the step for example uh, there is a one step and you want to add a subflow to that step right you can add it so that is how the development is going on uh, i think it is very exciting and uh, we will uh, hopefully we'll get all the answers also with uh, with all the recent developments and research fantastic so uh 
I, I, it's clear from this conversation that we could keep talking about this topic for much, much longer. There is uh, a whole world uh, of territory that I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface on. Um, but in the interest of time, I want to end with a question before we shift over and we start to take a couple more questions from the chat. Uh, since we have covered so much terrain, looking forward a little bit, um, let's think a little bit more speculatively. We've talked about, you know, increased ROI through being able to deliver applications faster to an organization. We've talked about the risks and the opportunities around quality control. Um, but more broadly, when we think about citizen development, Steve, you mentioned rightly that, you know, we could do a full history lesson on the past 25 plus years of uh, this movement within the, within the development space. But when we look forward, what are the impacts that we really think AI driven citizen development is going to have on the future of work? and the well, future you, uh, of IT in particular. Well, I think you're going to see a step change in the way that actually organizations operate and function, because there's historically been this siloed mentality of uh, the business and development. And there's normally been a big gap between what the business wants and what development needs to understand to build applications. And what um, AI is doing is helping to actually then bring together those two different subject matter experts and to accelerate the pace at which they can actually then deliver applications. And that's historically been the biggest challenge uh, to, to digitizing organizations is the sheer cost of that process. Well, with AI and uh, citizen development working closer with uh, DevOps, you can then start to digitize a lot more of an organization. So rather than just digitizing that 20 or 30% that you can afford, you can digitize 100% of it. So get rid of all those emails, get rid of Excel. You can now actually have a finger on the pulse of actually an organization operating almost in real time. But more importantly, being a lot more agile than it's historically been because you haven't got such a high inertia for the time it takes to build applications. So that's uh, in a nutshell, I think, kind of where this is going. It's going to actually kind of give us all as business owners the ability to do more faster at lower cost, but higher quality. A world fully in a bit in business without Excel or email, I, I can barely uh, even I don't believe that. Uh, how amazing it will be. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, yeah, it sounds like you've got some reservations. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, for for from before I before I answer your question, like, yeah, my response is, it's, I don't know if it, I, I don't know if Excel is going to uh, we try to kill Excel for years and, and just ha hasn't happened. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that, but anyways, more, back to your, back to your, back to your future. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I think to your point, Jess, though, is actually that oh, so there's back nothing to your fundamentally question, wrong right? with Excel. There's nothing wrong with Excel mm -hmm. itself. It's the fact that Excel itself has been, uh, stretched beyond what it should really be used for. That's really but, what the problem right, is. Um, right, but 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 then but then the interesting thing is that Microsoft is is adding AI to Excel, right? Because I don't know if you've seen the news. Like now you can. Now I think there's like a function that you can type in that actually you can actually like pull AI res pull responses. It's again that's kind of in the that's kind of like like in the local local realm of of of, uh, of of AI, right? You don't even need to. You don't even need need chat gpt you can just equal i forgot what the what the function is but pretty much you can have an excel in excel i saw i saw a video of it you have a you have an excel file on one column you have all the prompts right and you know in layman's terms just things i want to ask and then another com another com you just do a format equals whatever function it is a like like this the cell and it just copy down and then boom you have you have all your answers right so so I think I think no. I mean, if Microsoft's smart enough, they're going to continue to evolve Excel to try to not so it's not going to so that it doesn't get replaced by AI, but it's going to be enhanced by it. Um, mm -hmm. But back to back to the original question, right? Relate the way that I see um, how AI is going to impact and drive the future as a developer. 
uh, is that when we look at local no code, right? What local no code brought us for citizen development is it brought it brought us citizen developers. Uh, when it comes to AI, especially like the the you know, gener generative AI, I think it's going to give us your citizen business analysts, your citizen program uh, project managers, your citizen data wow. scientists. It's going to it's going to create more of these these uh, citizen roles that you don't have. You don't need to have someone specially trained in it, right? That you can that you can you can do these functions very uh, very easily, very quickly. Uh, so that means that 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 allows people to not do things that are pretty uh, that's pretty standard, but but really to focus on strategic uh, strategic uh, decisions. Like like instead of instead of instead of actually developing now, it's probably like what do I, what should I develop, right? And even that's probably going to get automated now. Have AI analyze like like all your processes. You know, we you know in you know, even like when it comes to like process automation, there's now there's what they call the intelligent process automation that looks at looks at what you do, right? Records all you do, and then try to propose propose workflows to automate. And AI can probably take that even further to actually give you all the to give you all the solutions already. So I think so. So I think the future of it is just to continue to continue to uh, give us give us the benefit of of not not having to have these so specialized roles right not having your pro pro developers for 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 local no code uh, citizen developers now we're going to have now you're going to have these have these different roles for example like earlier i just i just mentioned right i, I need a template for documentation right so people coming together and trying to argue and debate i just quickly block Quickly prompted in, and it gave me a, it gave me a, a very good first draft, and then that saves us time, and that saves us, you know, it, for companies that want to hire external consultants, right? You can just add, you can just throw it into, into AI and see what it comes up with. Um, so that's how I see like AI is going to yeah. going to, going to impact us. Amazing, and yes, I I, I uh, don't intend to cut you short at all, Jesse. For those who are joining us online, I wanted to mention that we are going to have another session uh, towards the end of Citizen Development Week to continue going over questions that have been asked in chat. So please um, tune into that. Follow the followings, uh, Jesse. It's a really provocative note to end on that when we talk about changing the nature of work. We're not only talking about changing the nature of an organization, like Steve mentioned, but we're talking about changing the nature of a job title. We're talking about changing the nature of a role within an organization. Um, I think that's a really provocative point. Uh, with that uh, said, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Um, little uh, teaser, we've got amazing questions about AI ethics. Uh, and the, the ethics behind some of these more speculative use cases that we've started to get into. Keep tuning in, uh, join us for a follow-up session later in the week to dig into that topic. Um, but until then, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sai. Thank you, Jesse, um, for all of your uh, a really wonderful conversation and uh, amazing insights. Thank you. Thank you. It's the time for us to ignite the desire to create.